<laughs> anyway, Philip, you, you obviously still can't connect. So something's happening. So I think what we'll do, what we'll do, I think we'll start and then we can hopefully then Philip can um, catch up. He's listening to what we have to say and then hopefully he can sort out his technical problems. Anyway, let's get started. Um, can I welcome you all to the first Mel Class Show webinar, which is fantastic. Um, this has come forward as an idea. We want to keep in, our members involved as much as we possibly can with what the show are doing, um, making sure that we are still alive and kicking. Um, I hope that you all are too, and that you are all staying positive and testing negative, which I think is the expression we're supposed to use. Um, tonight's webinar is um, all about uh, property and farming related issues. And the reason the reason we've decided to do this is um, those of you attending the show might well have decided to go and get a free drink off Greenslade, Taylor Hunt or Simmons and Sampson. And so you might have ambled into their stands um, and taken advantage of their tremendous hospitality. And you might have engaged with one or two people, uh, one or two experts on uh, the various fields that those firms deal with. And you might have got some pearls of wisdom on one or two of the questions that you wanted to raise. But so we've tried to replicate that this evening, but um, in the absence of any having any experts to talk about the properties and farming related matters, we've got we've got Justin Lowe and Philip Hodgkin of Greenslade Taylor Hunt, and we've got Ross Wilmings and Will Wallace of Sims and Sampson. So hopefully they will know what they're talking about, but we're about to find out. Um, how we propose to do this is that each of our panelists is going to give just a short talk about a subject that they claim to know something about. And then I'm going to open it up to the other panelists to come up with any questions and have a general chat. And then we'll go around all four and hopefully, hopefully um, that will enable all the points that come out amongst the experts in inverted commas uh, to be dealt with. However, you as other attendees, um, it's all interactive and you can send us questions. Um, if you do that on the Q and, I, Q and A icon, I will be able to see hopefully those questions and I will ask them on your behalf. Um, you can disclose obviously who you are depending on how rude the question is. And of the ruder ones, I'm very happy to put forward um, to them. Now, I don't know whether Philip, we've now got him and he can actually say something. Can we actually hear you, Philip? No. So, whilst I think Greenslades ought to pay their, pay their phone bill or their internet charge, I think that's probably what it is. So, let's kick off. Um, Justin has drawn the short straw and is going to kick off to start with. And he's going to talk about his little strap line is um, whatever it is. It is, here we are, lessons learned, an overview of the property market in 2020. Justin, over to you. Well, thanks, Nigel. And good evening, Paul, and I hope you can all hear me. I noticed that Nigel and I are the only ones without ties tonight. Um, so please don't read into that. Um, we're now in the second wave of COVID-19. I thought it would be helpful just to look at what effect this has all had on the property and land markets in this part of the world during uh, 2020 and what opportunities this may bring as well. Um, last week, I um, received a letter in the office from a national agent who's trying to buy an investment property from us. And uh, within their spiel, they mistakenly quote findings from July of this year. And it just shows how quickly things get out of date. Um, it was a report undertaken by the Centre for Economics and Business Research, and within it they stated that the housing market was predicted in July of this year, and this was at the end of July, um, to fall by at least 5% and then 11% next year. I thought perhaps their prediction was more relevant to the stock market or perhaps the commercial retail office property markets 
perhaps it applies to pubs and hotels and perhaps the other le leisure assets which have all been suffered uh, quite badly but it certainly doesn't apply to the residential property market as that's the one thing that's proved to be resistant to COVID-19 and, and it's if anything it's fed off the pandemic. Looking back at the at, uh, the spring lockdown it seemed to act as a sort of an incubation period as coronavirus fueled people's desire to move to south and west to larger homes often in more relaxed rural locations at more affordable levels. Um, one of the things I hear regularly on viewings when I'm showing people around is, and when I ask them and quiz them about why they're coming to this part of the world is that they simply say it's such good value down here and I think you all ought to take that home with you because it's something I think will be changing in years to come. Um, typical requirements we've seen this year across our offices from potential buyers and this is sort of a list of applicants um, and their requirements that they typically write down and, and give to us are larger properties with larger gardens, land very often, small holdings, residential farms, um, good views, clean airspace around them, the availability of good schooling, both state and private, um, at-home workspace, not just a study, but a designated area of the house, suitable buildings to convert. They want to be carbon and possibly now phosphate neutral, that's another subject in itself. They want buildings for business storage, access to train stations, but access is the important thing, not necessarily proximity. And I think that's the really important factor that's changed this year. And it's particularly poignant for West Dorset. Employers are now very relaxed about the regular attendance of their employees in central offices, which can now vary between once per week to once every two weeks to once a month. And I've even spoken to people who say they're probably never going to go back to, the, to their offices again. So work, working patterns have changed um, hugely. In what's going on this year and I'm sure will for future years to come. Another change has been the growth of technology and our increasing reliance on the internet um, as a source of information and conducting our lives and business. The requirement for good levels of internet speeds can now be a deal breaker when selling a property. If there's no hope of getting a decent download speed then we're unlikely to go much further uh, with the sale with some buyers. However, whilst the roads, and lanes, the roads and lanes around us are all forever busy with delivery drivers getting lost, this in turn provides an opportunity um, because there, will, there is an increased demand for rural warehousing and storage in good strategic locations. So for some, an opportunity beckons. We're now faced with the open-ended second lockdown that will undoubtedly affect many in individuals, families, businesses, and of course our way of life. The question is what will happen to this bull property market but according to several building societies most recently the nationwide who've commented to say that the house prices are growing at their fastest rate for over five years i i would say that they're actually growing at their fastest rate for nearly 15 years since 2006 um, early 2007. this is in turn affecting rental levels residential property which are now seeing growth in rates uh, rents rather with a lack of available supply um, the mortgage market, however, has changed over this period. And whilst we have historically low levels of borrowing, a word of caution, because many mortgage products are being reduced on a daily basis, whilst the lenders consider the effects of rising unemployment, a possibly uh, more inflationary economic climate next year, and increasing levels of tax, all of which will affect the ability to service borrowing. With regards to agriculture, land values during this period have remained relatively static and resilient, compared to other commercial assets. Trading has generally been in lower volumes and I think we're currently operating sort of 30 to 35% down on land values being sold on the open market this year. However, off market sales and purchases have been noticeably busier. Typically we're selling uh, in a sort of six and a half to 8,000 pounds an acre for commercial pasture land. I do um, make the point of it being commercial larger blocks arable land between eight and eleven an acre which has been consistent for the last couple of years of course we all know that if there's a keen next door neighbor interested then we can go wildly above these levels but in terms of open market discounting the special buyer then this is where we need to be notably commercial farming buyers are generally holding off at present whilst they weigh up the potential outcome of brexit covid and the agricultural bill Certainly this year we're seeing more interest in areas of land being suit, uh, suitable for planting woodland and generating tradable carbon credits. This will be something we'll be talking a lot more about in future years. 
Similarly, developers are starting to look for land for areas of biodiversity to offset the loss of wildlife and habitat on developments. And that's something else we'll be looking at very closely. So poorer quality farmland may well be suitable to meet these needs. And um, I suggest we all have a, a good think about that for future demand. Um, returning to the residential market, we know that these extraordinary market conditions cannot last forever. The second wave of precautionary measures may even act to fan the flames of the current market. And I think we'll see continuation of interest from outside our areas with buyers continuing to migrate west. Historically, we've sold a lot of property to buyers from Hertfordshire and Surrey. Buyers who've already made the first move out of town some years ago and commuted since. Now we're dealing with buyers from the central cities. Many of these buyers are moving to the rural areas for the first time. It's a lifetime dream being brought forward by the catalyst of recent events. They will need help with their new lives and we are all well placed to serve them. For those buyers, or sorry, for those buying or selling a residential property at the moment, undoubtedly completion by Christmas is the, is the aim of many people this autumn. And there's another target date currently on our radar of the 31st of March 2021, which all the solicitors are dreading, uh, which is the stamp duty uh, relaxation measure, which is due to end then. I think the question is here, will that be extended? And I think the length of this second lockdown will dictate if the chance is prepared to extend that. It's undoubtedly been a huge success at keeping the property market fluid and the property industry fully employed, but inevitably a huge loss of income for the treasury, which will have to be recovered in some shape or form. Will stamp duty when it returns be put on the seller solely or jointly with the buyer or return as before? Changes in capital gains tax levels in line with IHT and income tax and possibly agricultural property relief is going to come under the inheritance tax microscope. In summary, buyers will continue to be racing to find properties and complete purchases to avoid extra expense, money they could otherwise use as deposits or improvements to their new homes. It's going to be a hectic five months, nearly four months now, whilst we get these transactions put to bed. And then I'm afraid it's wait and see. So the, if there's one thing uh, that we've learned during 2020, it's to take each week as it comes. We will get there and there will be many opportunities for us all, which my colleagues will hopefully give you a further insight into. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you back to Nigel, our host. Thank you, Justin. That was really informative. You had canted through numerous things there, all sorts of, all sorts of subjects. Um, gentlemen, any thoughts on what Justin had to say? Agree, disagree, violently or otherwise? Oh, and Philip, are we, are we back on? Philip. Have we got Philip? Hopefully, hopefully you can hear me. Oh, yes, we have. Great, great. Fantastic. One of, one of the points that um, your partner, Justin, that's your business partner, I should add, your partner, Justin, um, said it was improved technology um, was an important factor. So I'm glad you've actually got there. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, Ross, Will, the Simmons and Sampson view on, on Justin's diatribe on behalf of Greenslades? I think our experiences echo very much, you know, what, what Justin's saying. So, um, yeah, residential market boiling. Um, and I think we feel that, you know, that can't last forever. Yeah. Um, farms and land, again, been very, very strong. Um, but, you know, lack of, you know, good quality property on the market. Um, and, you know, demand definitely out, outstripping supply. So, um, you know, nothing unusual there. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I love what Justin says. I agree with. Yeah, it, what, there, what there is a huge, huge migration, isn't there? From you know more sort of migration from the east across, um, particularly on the residential, um, and the land is very much, isn't it? It's dependent on who the neighbours are, and, and and you know if it's good quality land, it will still sell well. Yeah, yeah. Um, just out of interest, um, Justin or even Ross, have either of you come across any of the, the COVID clauses yet in any of the deals? Cool. I've had one today where they want to put in a COVID clause. Yeah, I, I, we not we've we've managed to avert those so far. Um, but um, so we have had those proposed in the past, but nothing. I haven't seen one actually last in a contract yet. But maybe that will change. They are they are increasingly um, becoming prevalent because I've seen them also um, in my experience and certainly in the development land market that there's a COVID clause in relation to failure to get a planning approval um, because of a variety of COVID related issues. So they mm. are there. And of course, it's a lawyer's dream to have another another clause to argue about. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had a 62 acre farm exchange and complete this morning. 
um, you know, again, would have been highly unusual for a farm to exchange complete on the same day. Um, but that, that's the sort of market we're working in. So, Any comments, Philip? No, no, add to an echo to everyone's comments. Um, it's remarkable what's been happening in the, in the marketplace this year. What, what do we think as a group that prices have gone up by over this over this year to date? What do you what do you all think? I'll tell you what I think, but I'll be interested to hear what you think. Well, let's put immunity land for a minute. I've been, we've all been putting strong guides on those, and they've been exceeded by up to one hundred percent. So, um, yeah. What about, you, what about you residential could, values? You could argue that's undervaluing things, Philip. You could, but, but but we're trying to keep up with the pace of the market. Yeah, um, we've got a, we've got a couple of questions already already coming in. I know there's some other questions that I've got here, um, which are, people have asked me um, previously to ask. Um, uh, what's a COVID clause? I think is the is the first question. Um, does anybody want to answer that, or is it? Are you happy for me to do that? I I can do that. Yeah, it, it, it's basically a, a clause that's been suggested by solicitors in property sales uh, that should either side, either the seller or the buyer um, or, or somebody immediately in the family have uh, COVID that they can basically de delay completion. Um, and, and the one which I'd seen yesterday was for up to three months. And the concern is, is from some sisters that, that, that some of the wording is woolly, should we say, and uh, could be open to abuse. And I think that's the, the concern that I've, I've come across is, is yeah, the, the concern for abuse, basically, um, as an, and an excuse to delay completion. OK, um, I've got a couple of other quick questions. Justin, um, is there been a change in um, the area, the acreage that people are looking to buy as hobby farmers um, or as attached to their house? Because it used to be people looking for pony paddocks, five, let's say to 10 acres, but are people looking for house buildings and more land than that? Yeah, I think, I think that's probably the case actually. And, and most of the requests we've had, um, a lot of the requests we've had this year have been, have been for that, have been for small farms. And I think they are, the acreage is going up and I think they want space around them. And often it's 20, 30, 40, 50 acres. So yeah, I think if anything, that acreage has, has crept up. Ross, is that your um, is that your perception? Yeah, um, you know, people wanted private, secluded was always high on their wish list. I think that's increased. That's that's for sure. Right. Well, we can have a, we can come back to this a bit later because there are some other questions that people have um, come in with. But I'm mindful of mindful of the time we're going to spend. We want to give you all a fair crack of the whip. So. Um, Let's go on. Um, we're going to go on, I believe, to to um, Pip next, aren't we? Um, Pip, you're on a more agriculture related subject. Um, mending the broken subsidy wheel, I believe, is your starter for 10. Hey, thank you, Nigel. Well, I'm not going to try and um, tell everyone what's happening at the minute with the schemes. Will's going to come on to that, but I'm going to try and give everyone a bit of a background as to the way the government are thinking and why things are changing and the way they're changing um, and particularly looking at BPS at, at the minute um, the government has sort of taken a step back and said what does it bring for the taxpayer uh, and everyone that's you know contributing towards the subsidies that farmers have been paid on, mm -hmm. a, on an area basis they're, they're coming up with ideas that it's frustrating change um, it's rewarding farmers to hold on to land uh, it can be seen to be increasing rents, particularly where landowners are letting land with, with BPS entitlements. And it's reducing the incentive for innovation um, within the industry. So, uh, and I'll come on to it in a, in a minute, but it's really removing that. Um, the, the, what they're trying to do is nowadays with public money for public goods, soil, water, and biodiversity and so on. So moving on to... Um, productivity which is which is a big thing with the government going forward uh, and I've just taken a quote here from Paul Krugman 1994 productivity isn't everything but in the long run it is almost everything uh, and what the government are wanting us to do is use efficient use of resources to produce output not necessarily more output but possibly more output 
and productivity from certain areas of land and using the other land for other things. And we'll come on to the carbon market and so on in, in a minute. Um, but essentially, on a global market, efficiency is going to help us bring um, bring us more in line with our competitive nature of uh, others. Just to give you an example, um, in the UK, they, they've noticed that agricultural productivity growth since 2000, since the year 2000, has actually fallen by about 0.7%. You look at some of our European counterparts, uh, the Dutch, that's gone up by 3.5%, and France, 2.5%. Um, so, so we're really lagging behind and, and they're wondering why. They've also anecdotally found that um, there's an increase in yield of about 19% through investment in skills, technology and innovation. And um, so, so that they're starting to sort of push those buttons now instead. They recognise as well that there are high performing farmers out there that are managing to make good margins uh, against say the bottom quartile that are probably losing money if it wasn't for subsidy. So um, they're just trying to target the, the, the money elsewhere. And to give you a little bit of a steer, um, the AHDB and Anderson's review a few years ago said 5% of factors are outside uh, farmers control. 85% of the gross of the average um, gross income from farms comes from trade with the 15% coming from subsidy support. But when you get to tinker with product prices, 10% um, movement in that product price can make up the 15% um, subsidy support. So there's an emphasis on trying to diversify. And I think Ross will come on to that in a minute, but sort of adding value to the products as well that, that farmers are able to produce. Uh, and again, the, the productivity. So um, the challenge for them is really that farmers are good at hunkering down. We're all good at hunkering down. Um, we're not necessarily driving productivity, particularly if there's a large cost burden associated with that. So they definitely have set up an agricultural productivity task force um, to really put the right people, the right farmers, the pro proficient farmers on the right land and who can equally use the right land for the right purpose. And, and taking that to one side, and Will's going to come on in a minute to um, productivity, um, some of the grants and things available. But I think there's going to find out we're going to find two markets shortly. Um, there's the food and the commodity market, as well as the environmental and, and the carbon market. So um, it, it's not as well progressed as one might have thought it would be, but, but, it, but it will be. And I'm sure that that latter one certainly will be coming out soon. The big new buzzword in all of this is, is natural capital. And that's the value of, of the environment to society. Uh, we're talking about soil improvements, um, storing carbon, managing water, whether that's managing flood or, or, or drought, um, air quality and pollution and climate change mitigation and so on. Um, and, but also the, the, another thing coming in really is the biodiversity net gains. And that is being seen in, in the planning system that's um, at, at the fore. George Eustace has proposed, well, at least for England, um, establishing an accurate centralised body of data, uh, of data on species populations. Um, he's setting out which habitats and species are, are off limit and then front loading and ecology, uh, ecological considerations into the planning system in a changed approach to environmental assessment and mitigation. So essentially um, looking for biodiversity net gain and you might say, well, why? why? And, but the reason why is that essentially the polluter will be paying then. And you ask, well, what does that mean? The likes of, let's just say, an airport or a development project or something like that will end up having to offset their carbon and they'll be coming to the likes of land managers, farmers, estates um, in order to do so. And that's where I think that carbon market will develop. The challenge that we all have as agents um, is really finding a pricing structure and a value to that um, pounds per unit and so on. Um, but but, but that, that will come out of everything um, that, that's in front of us shortly, the agricultural bill, the environmental bill, um, what happens with, with the planning systems and so on. So um, it's all emerging, but I'll, I'll shut up for a minute because I can come back to it. And, um, but Will, hopefully, I think is going to tell us what money's out there for us now and, and what's happening with BPS. Before we get on to that, um, and thanks for that, Pep, um, have, any, have any of you guys got any comments on the specific issues then raised by Pip? I've already had one question in. 
unless anybody else has got anything in particular. That is, um, how quickly, Pip, do you think the UK will witness productivity increases once area-based subsidies are completely phased out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think it will come fairly quickly. I think it's going to have to come fairly quickly. Uh, we don't know yet how it's going to work. Um, I have a bit of an inkling that it wasn't before, or COVID's come along, or for us, COVID's come along and, and put a bit of a, put the brakes on that. But I have a, I did have a sneaky suspicion it was around the corner. Your guess is as good as mine now, but it could be around the corner next year. It might be a few years down the line. And those, those that really want to jump on the bandwagon, we should be trying to do something sooner rather than later, but it is, it's going to take a bit of an industry standard to be to be set to, to, to get the pricing structure right. Um, but but yeah, ne I'll guess as early as next year if if there was no COVID. Can I I've, got another, I've got another one for you that's come in. Um, how quickly? Um, sorry, how long will it be before there is commercial demand for land to be used in your so-called carbon market? Hmm. That's what. There's all. There's, there will be demand pretty well, again, similar question, I guess, and, and almost impossible to answer with, with what's going on at the minute. Just around the corner, I think, Justin, unless you've got, or Ross or Will, if you've got anything else to say, um, but there are already blue chip companies out there looking to invest, and we've got people approaching us looking to invest, but everything's a little bit wishy-washy yet. Um, there might not necessarily be the incentives, or the incentives are still there for BPS. When that falls away, and once it falls away quite quickly, I think the carbon will come through for that poor or less versatile land pretty quickly. Okay. Any other comments on that before we go over to Will? Because I'm mindful we don't want to be, get, be talking all evening, and people have got they got their drinks to go to. Which <laughs> Pip, <laughs> sorry. Pip's on his red wine and Will's on it. Sorry, and Ross is on his scotch. I don't know what Will's got there now. Um, on the coffee. No, it's on the coffee. <laughs> um, right, Will, you're going to follow up to a certain extent, aren't you now? Countryside stewardship issues. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, well, countryside stewardship, uh, basic payment, um, elms, and also the, the sustainable farming incentive schemes. The latest of the words. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> I've got a lot to cover. <laughs> I will try and keep it as short as I can. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, the crux of it is that the current system is basic payment scheme, as everybody knows, BPS, and that will be phased out by 2028. Okay, well, 2027. So by 2028, it will be delinked and there will be no BPS payment. Next year, we'll see the first significant reductions in the payments. Um, so up to 30,000, they will see a 5% reduction. Uh, 30 to 50,000, we'll see a 10% reduction. 50 to 150, you'll see 20. And then 150 plus, we'll see a 25% reduction in what they're receiving. After that, in 2022 onwards, it is known that it will decrease. How it will decrease, nobody knows yet. It's, it's sort of all up for negotiation at the moment and it's being discussed. Um, but it, it will be reducing, um, there's, there's, there's no question. Uh, in terms of next year, the rules basically remain the same, except for there are no crop diversification in the FA rules. So. It's not to say you won't be required to record what crops you're growing, but you will not need to meet crop diversification and EFA requirements next year. One of the things that has been talked about is a lump sum um, one-off payment. Again, details of this with everything that's going on are slightly all in the air. Um, and there will be a reference year that it will be based from. The opinion of the experts is basically don't get too excited. Um, I think a lot of people have thought, wow, you know, big lump of money. It, it is not going to be. And, and they've been pretty clear to say that it is not going to be very exciting. So if, you, if you're there thinking, right, we're going to retire, take this lump sum payment, I would wait. 
for a moment before before going buying the holiday home or the boat. Just wait. Um, so he is, I think, with DPS, you've just got to look at your accounts and what part of that of your profits, if there are profits, how much of that is your DPS payment each year. And you know, I do sit with clients who sit there and oh, we're doing very well. Da, 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 da. How much of that, you know, you take off the bottom of that balance sheet, the BPS, how much profit is actually left from that business? And when you when you actually do that, it is quite scary. Um, so I think people do need to, if they're not in stewardship, look at the BPS and say, are we dependent on it or not? And if they're not, now is the time to really look at the business and work out what you're going to do. So we know that there is going to be a new scheme coming in, which is going to be ELMS, and that is going to start from 2024. Uh, there are already some pilot schemes running, and there will be an opportunity next year, in March 21 next year, to um, express some interest to also join in more pilot schemes with ELMS. Okay. Um, uh, Will, can I just ask for, the, uh, for those of us who are not fully up to speed on this, what ELMS is? It's the Environmental Land Management Scheme. So this will be the new basic payment, what will replace the basic payment. So the basic payment will go down, and then there'll be a new scheme that will come in, which will be the ELMS, and then that'll go up and replace it gradually. And then by 2028, there'll just be ELMS running through, and there'll be no BPS. So it'll be delinked. Um, and the proposal, and then there are, you know, nothing is set in stone, so please do not take what I'm saying is that is exactly what it is. There are a lot of ifs and buts with it, but the current, what has been announced by George Eustace and in the bill is that there'll be three tiers. So there'll be tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one will basically be for those who are not in countryside stewardship, and that will be called the sustainable infrastructure, let me get it right, sustainable infrastructure, payment okay yeah sustainable farming incentive sorry and that will be based on more focus on environmental and sustainability and farmers will be required to have a land or a soil management plan and that will be a, a if you like a, a starter you know entry level type of payment that will replace the bps and that will be for basically doing your cross compliance um and having pest management plans and that type of thing will be required for that fortunately will you frozen now you're back with us i think sorry <laughs> technology yeah. failed Ooh. you're back we're back now so tier will be what will be basically a stepping stone for countryside stewardship okay and and there are pilots for those being tested at the moment and then tier three will be basically what will replace like your higher level and and your higher tier at the moment so that will be the replacement for that and that'll be much more sort of specialist okay so countryside stewardship you are still able to enter at the moment and i don't know what sort of the feedback will be from pip and from justin but certainly Last year, we see we saw a much greater uptake of countryside stewardship, mm. and this was basically because they have at long last listened and they have made it more simple. Um, it is not as bad as it looks. Still, it, you know, if you if you go online, they won't provide you with a manual. You have to do everything online, and there are hundreds of options, and you know they, they've got all these different words and buzzwords in there, and it, it does look particularly complicated, but it's not actually as complicated as it looks and they have made it a lot more simple. They are going to make it more simple over the next couple of years, and they are actively encouraging people to join countryside stewardship for 2022 and 2023. Um, basically, so agreements start on the 1st of January of each year, and they're five-year agreements, um, and, and they have confirmed that anybody that joins a countryside stewardship will not be financially disadvantaged once the ELMS have come in. So they have guaranteed that. DEFRA have said they will not be disadvantaged by any way. So the reason they've done that is to keep people encouraging them to go into it, basically. Um, 
So what I would say is if you are thinking of doing countryside stewardship, you've got to really do your research and look at it and don't just change your farming practice to make it suit countryside stewardship. You've got to look at what you're doing at the moment, what land you're utilising, you know, what's your worst land, what's your best land. Have you got margins under woodlands that you're not, you know, that aren't productive, um, steep banks, yeah, all that type of thing that aren't actually having fertiliser at the moment that you could be claiming payments for. Um, so areas of soil erosion, that's another area that they're sort of targeting and you want to look at. Um, we, you know, for example, I've got some figures here of what we did last year, we, you know, a typical, we did a 300 acre mixed farm, which was pasture and arable. And we basically fitted it to what was going to work with what was already on the ground. So there was already six meter margins around the arable fields. Um, so we put some six meter margins around some of the arable fields. They didn't have to change anything. Uh, there was one field which had had a problem with soil erosion that they wanted to put back to grass. So we got the arable reversion payment on that. And there was a small area that they wanted to do some winter bird food. Now the payment on that comes to basically £9,000 a year. Plus in addition, they wanted to do some fencing. So we got a grant of £9,000 for some fencing as well. So over five years, you know, it's 45,000 plus another the, the payment for the uh, fencing as well. Um, another farm, bigger farm, we got basically six and a half thousand metres worth of fencing approved last year, four pounds 90 a metre. We've just had quotes back around in the mid, about mid five pound 50 around that sort of figure from a contractor. So it's going to cost them basically 60p a metre to have six and a half thousand metres of fencing done on their farm. So yeah, that's a grant of 31,000. So there are some decent chunks of money out there if you're worth, you know, if you're prepared to spend the time looking at it and, you know, going around the farm and putting something that works. Um, what I would say, what we've learned is don't go for too many options. Keep it simple. Just look at the farm, have three or four options because there are a lot of different dates for each option. And, and if you're not careful, you tie yourself in knots of different dates for everything. So you've got to be quite specific and keep it to what you want to do. Um, just very quickly, I'll just, just give you a couple of rates. I mean, hedge, hedge planting is £11.60, fencing £4.90. Um, winter bird food mixes, £640 a hectare, comes back at £259 an acre. Um, grass margins on arable fields, £353 a hectare, so it's £142 an acre. So if you've got a grass margin, a six metre margin under a woodland that's not growing anything, you could put it back to grass for five years and it will earn you, once you put the grass in, obviously it's £142 an acre. Um, other just things just to look out for um, is the hedgerow and boundary grant scheme, which is coming out next year again. And also there will be a replacement scheme to the countryside productivity small grant scheme, which is for uh, livestock equipment and decision technology for arable farmers. Okay, well, that's really, really in depth again, really helpful, all sorts of things there. Chaps, any, any comments, questions then for Will? Justin was nodding his head sagely or um, one, other, one, other, one other way he nods his head, but- um, yeah. But the stat that always seems to come up, and I'm sure you have uh, seen it a lot, is that um, without single farm payment, 60, six, over 60 percent of farmers would um, wouldn't be making anything at all. What do you what do you think that figure is going to look like? Let's say in three five years time, um, once we're coming out of single farm payment and into the new scheme, are we are we are farmers going to, are those same farmers going to be making any more money, or are there going to be any less money? I think it depends what, whether they sort of look at what's going on in the wider world at the moment and, and, and sort of wake up to it and, 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 you know, actually make the most of the opportunities that are out there at the moment with Elms countryside stewardship and, and, and look at it. Um, but there are a lot of 
not a lot, but there are uh, there are some inefficiency amongst some farmers, isn't there? For certain, mm. and you, mm. I, I think it's becoming the days of where they could have just carried on and on and on and made money. I'm afraid I think are are coming to an end with it, um, and, and it, it is going to become much more competitive. I've got some other questions that have come in. Um, apart, well, apart from the potential financial gain, are there any other benefits in entering countryside stewardship? Um, yes, there are. Uh, well, well, the obvious ones are obviously wildlife. Um, you know, there are significant wildlife gains, and actually, you know, some of the ones we did last year it was really, really encouraging. Some of the people we met and met and put schemes together for that actually it is not all driven about money there are a lot of really really good farmers out there that want to put some good back into the wildlife and into the environment so yeah you've obviously got the wildlife and environmental gains the other gain i suppose would be you know uh, we, we, we've got a, i've got a small farm at home and we've got a campsite for instance we've actually just gone into stewardship and we put fire rich margins in and we've made sure that they're right beside where the campsite is because you know we put it in other parts of the farm but it, it is a good bit of pr so you know and it's nice to see putting some good back in so yeah okay so it's not all money and uh, we got not a very detailed, a detailed question here again for will how do the costs of seed mixes compare to the income payment <laughs> <laughs> it depends who you buy the seed from <laughs> 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 no, oh, well, that's, the um, that's the answer to that question then. Yeah, no, it, 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 it depends. It does depend. And actually, um, I do have here one seed company. Um, other, other seed companies are available, of course. Available. <laughs> um, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised last year when we were, I, for one of my clients, I had to actually cost up all the seed for AB8s and AB9s and the different ones. The, what, yeah, I think the dearest was about sort of nine. Some of them we were finding were sort of ninety pounds an acre around that sort of mark. AB8 uh, around seventy to eighty. So there is a bit, quite a bit of investment, um, more than just putting grass in. But you then need to spread that over the five years. You can't just look at it as being, right, we've got to spend all that money. You need to spread that back over the years. And even with the cost of the grass seed, which all the seed specialist seeds, it is more than just straightforward grass lays. It is worthwhile. Thank you, Will. Thank you. As time marches on inexorably, um, we're back on a very, very little short presentation from Pip again before we're keeping the best to last, of course, with Ross. But um, <laughs> Pip, you're going to talk about um, farm rents, aren't you, on, on AHA tenancies, Agricultural Holdings Act tenancies. So a short, a short presentation on that would be helpful. So we give Ross. <laughs> the benefit of the stage for a grand finale. <laughs> okay, no, thank you, Nigel. I don't have a huge amount to say, but it's always a question that crops up in, in, at seminars. Um, there's always landlords present, there's always tenants present, and everyone's always um, seems sometimes quite keen and eager to find a few more pounds from the tenant or the tenants to, to cut the, the rental um, rent demands by, by a small margin too. So I was just going to give a little bit of a traffic light system um, to those in the various different sectors and a very brief summary. We're all aware what's happening with the weather, um, where the arable systems are. Landlords might be looking at the wheat price at the minute, for example, and thinking, well, well you know, there might be some, some scope here. All I would say is just look at the rest of the crop rotation uh, and what, what's been lost. There was, I think last year, all seed rape um, area was down 32% with, with the problems that that's bringing. So I wouldn't, if I was a landlord, I, I don't think I'd be rushing in uh, for any rent reviews um, in that sector. And looking at the dairy sector, we all know um, the, the variances between one end of the spectrum and the other. Again, you need to know, know your eggs on that one, but um, it all depends where your starting point is, doesn't it? Uh, and where you think you are, whether there's any scope or not. Moving on to the quickly to the beef and lamb, um, that beef and sheep farmers are having a little bit of a good time at the minute, but it, they haven't had a good time for a long time. And so I think it's really an opportunity for them to invest um, any profits that they might make this year to catch up on, on the years gone past. 
uh, whether it's um, machinery, genetics, and so on. So um, I, I would be hesitant in just rushing in there off the back of a good one. Vice versa, tenants looking at all, all three um, sectors there. And what Will said, I wouldn't also be rushing at um, any rent, rent reductions until we sort of know exactly what's happening with the with the payments and how quickly they'll be dropping away. Um, again, sorry, it, it's not really a, a suitable answer for everyone, but I do get asked all the time, what, what can I do? Is there any scope? So I would just, if your market rent is where it should be at the minute, sit tight for a little longer uh, and, and don't frustrate the situation between landlord and tenant. Justin, Ross, any other thoughts on rents, that sort of thing? Um, it's going to be an interesting period. Yeah, I think we're going to see some notices without a doubt being served. Um, I think I think I think there's there's trouble uh, trouble ahead, and I do think we're going to see you know, quite a lot of tenants serving notices um, next year. Um, you know, we we need to see some. Uh, as I say, in tw twelve months' time could be a different story for the tenants, but 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 right now I would just sit tight for a little longer. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they will. We it's usually the advice: sit tight, isn't it, until we know more, and it's. It's all evolving, but um, I just sense there's quite a lot of difficulty out there. And I think um, you know that might start. We might start seeing a few more notices being served by tenants. Yeah. Um, and once again, we're asking people to tender for you know five-year agreements when they haven't got a clue what what subsidy yeah. they're going to be receiving. So it's it's very difficult. Yeah, extremely difficult environment. Okay. Now I've had a question come in, which is going back to Will, and I'm doing this slightly out of order, but. The person concerned has put a little note on his question saying that his wife's told him his supper's on the table, so he wants a quick answer to his question. And the question, Will, is, is, is there any restriction on the type of fencing to get one of these grants? Um, oh yeah, I just, I've just seen that question as well. Um, yes, yeah, so you can have creosoted and you can have panelised, but you cannot have the clip -ex. Well, there's a, okay. there's a nice, neat question, and he can go and get, yeah. he can go and get his supper now, whether, whether there's he's another one to give it to him or not. It was, yeah. okay. Anyway, right, um, as time moves on, um, unbelievably, uh, Ross, um, you're our last speaker, as it were. Um, your strap line is a good time to review your assets, looking at the agricultural land, farm, buildings, and diversification, including equestrian market issues. Ross, over to you. Uh, thank you, Nigel. Um, yeah, so I got the graveyard spot, so uh, I hope you're still all awake. Um, Ross Wilmington, I'm a partner, um, mainly working in the farm agency department uh, in the Axminster office of Simmons and Sampson. Uh, joined the firm uh, nearly 18 years ago. Yeah, I was only 15 when I joined. I thought you would um, be thinking that. Um, mainly work in East Devon, West Dorset, South Somerset. Uh, happy to travel, especially into stags or GTH territory. I don't know exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think um, I think you should say, you're, Ross, you're you're very active in the Melplash show area. Is the correct? Yes, answer. quite, quite, quite. <laughs> um, only agreed to do this because I was offered to drink some of Nigel's whiskey, and um, yeah, and and now lockdown, and we we can't leave our our houses. So, um, who would have thought attending Remembrance Sunday and a work-related Melplash show webinar? would be the social highlights of one's week. Uh, welcome to life in lockdown. Uh, 2020 has been a difficult year for many rural businesses, uh, particularly if you've diversified into tourism. Um, we see holiday cottages on many of the farms that we act for, uh, and the vast majority have some sort of diversified income, uh, and many of those streams have been hit this year. Um, I thought lockdown, you know, we're all spending more time at home. It might be just a good time to reflect um, and look at opportunities and reflect on property assets. Um, so vast majority of our farming land owning clients are millionaires on paper. Uh, the old adage, uh, asset rich, cash poor, um, will apply to very many. Um, I quite often have the conversation with clients, are you fully utilizing all of your farm? Are there any non-core, non-productive areas of the farm that could be liquidated to invest in equipment, uh, livestock, or, or new infrastructure? Um, so I thought a few examples of those 
um, perhaps an offline block of land um, too far away to graze with a dairy herd, perhaps not cost effective to drive to or to silage or till. Um, perhaps little parcels of woodland, parcels of land that aren't you know, utilised, aren't used very much. Uh, steep, awkward areas of land, perhaps difficult to access with large modern machinery. Um, redundant farm buildings, we talk about quite a lot, but you know, lots of opportunities out there. Um, looking at alternative uses, perhaps storage conversion. Um, you know, some of our recent results, our October auction was um, live streamed, but um, we had an old scrapyard at Hawkchurch, uh, acre site, uh, scrapyard, former workshop, uh, guide is 75,000. It sold for 214,000. There's some, some sort of staggering um, results going on at the moment. Um, block of 36 acres of land. That I expect uh, a few of you drive past regularly at Burton Bradstock. Uh, had an old pillbox on it, Coast Guard Tower. Very, very unproductive, hadn't been farmed for years. Uh, sat right on Cogton Beach. A guide of 300, 325,000. I think very limited planning potential. Um, that sold in our October auction for 455,000, nearly 13,000 pounds an acre. Um, and I don't know what you do with it. Um, um, little site on the edge of Collerton, uh, two and a half acres, edge of the village, um, had a, a quite a strong covenant against building, a uh, historic covenant. Um, clients took planning, barristers' advice. They thought that the covenant was enforceable. Um, we took that one into the auction um, with a very, you know, tempting guide, 30, 35,000. Um, that sold for 129,000, nearly 48,000 an acre. Um, there are still no houses on that land that was sold a couple of years ago. Um, I think what I wanted to say was talk through ideas. So I'm sure we all have ideas. Um, talk them through at an early stage with your land agent. Um, talk to your accountant, talk to your solicitor. Um, think about you know, the amount of investment that you've got to put into some of these assets and the return that you will get. I've got many a client, um, including myself, who had no mortgage and um, you know, no holiday cottage. They now have a mortgage and a holiday cottage. Were they better off before or, or after said holiday cottage? As I look out the window and there is no lights on. Um, think about depreciation of the whole of your farm. So, you know, if there is a, a view that we could dispose of something, we need to look at the value of the whole and is that going to be affected by our, our plans? Um, check your deeds, check the quality of the title. Is it under mortgage? Um, I put use established local agents who know the market and know their buyers, um, which I think is incredibly important. Um, Look at do you, have any names, do you have any names that you could put forward? I can think of a, 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 think of a good few, yeah. Um, two in particular. Um, option agreements, uh, promotion of development sites. I know something that Nigel does a lot of. Uh, both of our firms do as well. Um, planning policy is, you know, is very fluid at the moment. So a lot of these development boundaries are removed. Uh, looking at exception sites. Um, there are still district councils crying out for housing. Um, it is now the time to you know, actually grasp the nettle and, and look at some of those sites. Um, recently, I was um, up at South Chard, um, went to value or was asked to go and value um, some stables um, with a little tiny, you know, not even an acre paddock. Um, you know, I think the vendors were thinking it was going to be worth, you know, 100,000 at very best. Um, you know, we're now less than 12 months later, we've secured planning for five houses on that site. They didn't have a clue it was a, a development site or had development potential. So just take a step back, take advice. Um, we may see things as agents that you don't see. Um, you've lived there all your lives. So it's far too obvious for you. You know, you, you, you can't see it. Um, but a set of fresh eyes um, may be what you need. Um, Brief equestrian market update. Um, there was a law change 1st of October 2020. Um, it's now a legal requirement for all horses, ponies and donkeys to be microchipped and passported. So um, it's an offence if you don't. 
Um, pony paddock prices, um, still very strong. Uh, Justin touched on it, but again, lack of supply, good demand. Prices, you know, 15,000 an acre, probably at the minimum, often up to 25 and, and more, um, thousand pounds an acre. Um, larger paddocks, fields, offering better value. Um, I think some of the larger equestrian units, um, we saw quite a big equestrian centre down the other side of Exeter recently. Um, it's all about your books. Your books are paramount. Um, and if they're a new business or the books, you know, don't look as good as they should, then it, it does make it a, a harder sale on some of these equestrian units. Um, my conclusions, uh, good opportunity to use this time, the darker nights, step back, look objectively at your farm, your property, take good advice and the right advice at an early stage. Uh, don't wait until age makes decision making more difficult. I think that's a, a key. We retire a lot of farmers at 60, 70, and it's, it's very easy. We also retire a lot at 70, 80, and it's much more difficult, you know, just much more difficult. Um, engage with the next generation. Um, make your asset work for you. Um, I think that's my conclusions. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Gents, any comments to Ross? I've got some questions that um, have come in, but if, any before those, have you got any observations on the, the wise words of Mr. Wilmington from East Devon? I would only echo, yeah. I would only echo, Nigel, what, what Ross finished up by saying is so trying to plan ahead when you're at an age where, and dare I say it, but where decisions are easier and are pragmatic and you're involving the family rather than leaving it to a later date when it can sometimes be rushed. Um, it's easy for me to say it as a, possibly a younger person sometimes, but um, I see it all the time and no doubt Ross, Justin will, will do as well. I've got a related question, which actually I'd thought of myself um, because of my elderly uh, status in life. Um, should we be, be looking at landowners? Should we be looking at transferring non-agricultural assets out of their estates for IH, IHT purposes, inheritance tax purposes? Not that I'm thinking of passing on in the foreseeable future, but I just thought it's something that people think about and of course then don't really, don't really want to deal with because it's too difficult. Think I think... We're, oh, sorry. Well, I think um, we're all aware, you know, BBC News, I think, has even got an article on it today. You know, the Chancellor has to find a way to pay for this. Um, so, you know, I think uh, agricultural property relief, business property relief, you know, they, they may be easier targets. And, you know, there's been a lot of people saying for a long time, you know, why do farmers get the certain tax advantages that, that they do? Um, whether we see those challenged... Uh, even more so over the next few years, I think it's it's quite possible. Mm. Justin, any views on that? Yeah, I, I think it's got to be looked at. I'm, I'm spending a lot more time now talking to farmers and landowners about IHT planning. I think a lot of them are getting the message that they need to look at their assets and really what needs to be transferred and uh, what can stay within. So um, I think, yeah, really important to look at that continually. But as, but as Ross said as well, to look at it with your other advisors. Don't, don't just come to one advisor. We, we won't have all of the answers. Um, speak, speak to the solicitor, speak to the accountant. I've got a very good question that's come in um, from somebody who's anonymous. So I um, don't know who this is from, but extremely good question. Will progressive farmers looking to expand their business and buy land be able to compete with outside investors. Demand from blue chip companies and people moving to the area will surely drive price, prices up, especially with grants and subsidies, etc. So the outside influence of people other than perhaps indigenous farmers may cause an imbalance. What do you think of that? It'll, it'll, it'll hinge on what the supply is. I think we've had a low supply of late. I think um, if we're gonna see a greater supply, then It'll be, uh, it may be easier to, to, to continue to expand with commercial units, but um, yeah, there is, there is every possibility and threat that we, the, the outside money could, could dictate for a while. I, I may have misinterpreted the question here, but also I think the carbon market is really for the, the less versatile land 
the poorer quality land that is already at a lower value against the more versatile land, the arable land that, that, that's up there. And so what it might do is where arable land's done that, pasture land's doing that, it might bring the pasture up mm -hmm. and the arable back a bit and there'll be a little bit, there won't be the same divergence um, that's in the market at the minute. Who knows? But I don't think arable farmers will be driven out, for example, on good quality land by blue chip companies looking for um, to plant trees up. They'll, they'll go for the cheaper land elsewhere. I think okay. I Justin or agree, but it's also interesting how often you know, we anticipate outside money is going to take it or whatever the said property is. And it is interesting how often local money still comes mm. to the fore. And I think it, yeah. it always pleases us when it does. Mm. Uh, this is a, another question, again, from an anonymous attendee. This sort of relates to what Justin was saying earlier on at the outset of this webinar. Um, the question is, post-COVID, what areas do the panel feel there might be opportunities for diversification as indeed a direct consequence of COVID? Well, the, the obvious one is, is the staycation, isn't it? Is the people with the holiday, holiday staying in the UK? Because I, I can't remember the exact figure that was quoted the other day, but there's a phenomenal amount of people that you know, would normally be away, at holiday, away abroad at this time of year. And, and they're just not able to do so that there's I think there's going to be quite an opportunity for you know staycations for, for camping holiday still in in the UK for the next foreseeable two or three years um, in my opinion plus also that as Justin mentioned earlier there has been you know quite a spike and increase in commercial um, space requirement because there has been quite a, a drive of these online deliveries basically and um, people moving out of the cities mm, i think that's only going to grow i think i agree and i think that's that will drive demand will you know farmers and landowners should look really carefully at their business at their buildings is there space to convert to provide that rents could um, be looking very attractive and again i've got another question um, before we close seeing we've overstepped our time allocation is are you really seeing an upturn in people is the this is really i think both for um, an agency and agricultural agency and also residential are you are you really seeing a marked change that people are coming from the east is there a, a tsunami yeah. of people from the east or is it a mild a mild wave no it's it there's a lot of people we're talking to from london and the home counties at the moment it's quite a little bit during it has quite a in the last few weeks just because of lockdown but uh, as you'd expect but but no it's been noticeably much busier with a lot of people uh moving down to this part of the world or trying to move down to this part of the world and um i'm convinced that will that will continue on okay uh, that market will rely on those who are moving from london to sell their properties yes there as well. so of well, course there is a time lag but um if that slows up it might yeah, well i'm selling two small one yeah two country properties let's say houses with land at the moment two london buyers central london buyers and they're both doing exactly the same they both they can't sell their own properties in central london at the moment and what they're doing is they're let, they're, they're getting let to buy mortgages on their properties okay well i don't want to um take up any more time of our experts in inverted commas other than to say a huge thanks and i'm sorry i've been flippant and rude to you all but that's my that's my job isn't it um so again uh will ross philip pip and justin thank you very much indeed for spending the time now normally you spend time um doling out drinks and talking to people at the show so i'm sure our attendees will just be interested in you doling out drinks to them when they come to your houses when they got some further questions so don't don't get don't stop the booze um order that uh, all of you have got away with this year in not having to fund having to fund the shows okay so everybody thank you very much um we're going to do this all again in a fortnight's time um we're going to the next one is going to be on horticulture and we're delighted that we've got well-known horticulturist charlie uh, McCormick going to be our principal um, speaker on that together with some of his colleagues and he's going to be talking about what you should be doing 
um, in your garden at this time of the year, um, as opposed to just walking around it and moaning at it, what actually proactively you should be doing in your garden. And he'll also be talking about the very interesting subject of how they get those vegetables and flowers ready for the show. So obviously they missed out this year, but I'm always amazed how they grow leeks four foot long, etc., and related matters. So that's going to be on the 25th of November. And then we're going to do another one just before Christmas um, on local uh, food, uh, produce and drink. Uh, it's very much Christmas related one, which will reflect um, some of the people who would normally you'd see in the food tent at the show. Uh, my final comment is to obviously thank you all for watching. Um, rest assured, members and all of you that we are doing our utmost to make sure that 2021 show will go ahead, but obviously it's outside of our control, but we will do our absolute utmost to make sure that it happens and all the other events that we run. So thank you very much indeed. I hope you've enjoyed it and you can all go off and have your supper. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all.